You are listening to The Pilgrim on the 405 with Will Christ. Join him as he and his guests discover how businesses thrive in California. Well, welcome to The Pilgrim on the 405. We have a wonderful show ahead of us today. We have a great conversation with Mike Skripnik. And now, Mike is not just the typical coach that you might find uh, when you Google a coach on the Internet. Mike is somebody who's going to challenge you not only to succeed, but to help others succeed, too. So, Mike, welcome to the Pilgrim on the 405. Thank you so much, Will. Just amazing to be here. Uh, a glorious fall day. Yep. Yep. So tell us where you are, where you are seeing this fall day right now. <laughs> I'm located in a small town called Squamish in British Columbia, Canada, and that's parked midway between uh, Vancouver and Whistler. So one of the most beautiful cities and one of the biggest and most amazing uh, summer and winter resorts on the planet. So uh, very blessed to be in this location. Excellent. So tell us a little bit about uh, a, a little bit about Grow, Get, Give. Well, Grow, Get, Give was uh, actually it was a it kind of evolved out of my experience of creating my own niche business within the financial industry. And back in 2008, I think we can all recall, there was a little bit of a crisis going on. It's hard to recall when there's so many back to back crises. However, back then, <laughs> the, the sky was falling. The financial world literally was on edge and the edge of disaster. Uh -huh. I was driving home and in my brand new Audi, going to my brand new home, you know, I was supposedly, you know, on top of my game, um, worried. And I was listening to the radio as I saw snow falling in mid-September. <laughs> <laughs> and on the radio was me. And I was listening to myself recording, you know, talking about on the, on the news segment about Lehman Brothers going under. And, you know, that moment, I just kind of really didn't like my life. I was, I was wondering what I was doing day to day. Here I was in, you know, the greed is good world. And yet my life on the weekend and evenings was about giving back and being part of it. So I decided that day to change everything. And within a short period of time, commit a million dollars a year to charity. And in the financial industry, that's a bit difficult because we're kind of conditioned to hoarding versus mm -hmm. giving. And the path to realize that success had to me had me to reinvent my business, um, reinvent why I was there, and put it all out there. And so, grow, get, give was really about how I did it. And grow your business by becoming a marketing and credibility expert. Um, get more freedom because you couldn't work seventy or eighty hours a week any longer and have a family and a good life. So I figured out how to people, processes, and systems would save me and give me freedom. And then giving back, obviously, um, was about the return. And, you know, then it, ultimately, I found that it was give up front and give up back. <laughs> so it was like, gr give, grow, get, give, you know, it was people who wanted to make an impact, sought me out. And then I helped them fulfill that. And from then on, uh, you know, after six years, we had achieved the goal, 12 million to charity. And it was just an amazing experience. And my business was doing everything I wanted to. And I said, it was now time to show others. So I captured all of that and put it out there as part of my coaching, named my coaching program, and then ultimately named my last biggest book after that um, is Grow, Get, Give, Secrets to a Grow, Get, Give Life. Uh-huh. Well, all right. So let me let me share with you what the EOS life is, and let's talk about how that fits in because I think there's some some places here where uh, there's some some supportive uh, I think some supportive ideas here. EOS life is five things: you only do what you love doing. All right, sounds to me like you're doing that. Oh yeah. Um Go ahead. And you only do it with people that you love. Correct. You are making a a significant impact, significant difference. You're being compensated appropriately, and you have plenty of time left over to for your other passions. Yeah. Yeah, it's absolutely in in lockstep with EOS. Change everything. 
um, I invested in coaching. Good. In the early days of that, in, in this transformation of my business, um, it was all about that. And, you know, some of those principles, you know, a lot of the principles that Dan, you know, espoused uh, was definite, were definitely critical and, and very consistent. So when you think about the grow part, it really is about finding your why and that thing that you do special and unique that others may not and do as much of it as possible. And yeah. so that, and then, and then I built marketing and positioning, basically positioning and packaging around how to promote that. Yep. Um, and, and that's uh, what, what, what I picked up from Dan in, in, in Dan's coaching is, is this idea of unique ability. Correct. Because when you're working in your unique, unique ability, you're loving what you do. The whole phrase, um, you pay to do what you do. Um, yeah. You know, the day that you felt that I would, I would love to, I would pay anything to do what I'm doing. That day should also equate to the day that you were paid the most, right? That really yeah. commensurate compensation would connect with the day that you would have given it away would be the day that you've probably the most. And that sensation, that feeling when it is, uh, when it's happening is really, you know, really special. And for me, it was my unique ability really comes down to that ability to, you know, discover. And so this made me really effective in the financial service planning world um, was the discovery. I could draw out with three questions, everything I needed to know about a person's dreams their goals and their finances. I mean, the, the conversation will last maybe an hour and a half, but all I had to do is ask three questions and then probe and poke, you know, and, and then is this, the other, three, is this Dan's three questions? It's similar, uh, similar. I, I, add okay. a, I have a couple, I have a nuance to them, but no question. The first one is about your R factor or, but ultimately I, I think dream. And I, I want people to get out of our context. We are trained through our lives from the time we're children. When we dream, we could do anything like be astronauts to ultimately protect and preserve. And so we, rem we use this risk management, you know, strategy that we develop as adults and we take out all the fun of dreaming. And so when people were asked about their financial future, they think in terms of what they have today, where they live today, who they hang with and what jobs they have. They never got out of it. And I said, you know, but I thought you would love, I thought you loved Italian food. What about going to Italy and living, you know, training in a Tuscan school for a summer? Wouldn't that be great? And people went, I never thought of that, but I have this and I have that. And I go, well, why can't you make that happen? You're going around once here. <laughs> right. Know? Let's yeah. build a plan to that. Well, well yeah. I mean, like, like what what we talk to people about in EOS is helping leaders get what they want. And we talk about it from their business. But when we talk about the EOS life, doing what you love really means opening up the possibilities. It means that. And one of the most, uh, the thing that probably stuck with me the most about the early days of strategic coach training and is consistent exactly with the EOS principle is um, the per per performance base to behave like celebrity, mm -hmm. right? And I view every time I'm working, like that face-to-face -face focus time, if you will, is my performance. It doesn't mean I'm putting on a show. It means I'm on. I'm at my best. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. consistent with, you know, the four agreements and, you know, there's one of the agreements is do your best. And mm -hmm. that's when I'm called upon to perform. And everything now, else is about preparation or rest. Well, let me ask you, what's the relationship in your mind? What do you think the relationship between performance and authenticity is? The connection? <laughs> um, because there are, there are some people who... Now, now, I think there's some latitude here. And the reason I do is because some people are naturally introverts. And so oh. in order to be at their best, they need to rehearse and rehearse oh, yeah. and rehearse and rehearse. And so yes. sometimes if that rehearsal comes across um, as disingenuous, it's because they've lost the connection between who they are and why yeah. they're there doing what they do. Right. Yeah, and their so authenticity, the right? Right. So their the rehearsal becomes rote. Yes. Um, whereas I'll rehearse 
from my core, from who I am and why. And, and then it will flow and people will automatically understand that I'm not up here just spouting off things I don't believe and trying to convince. I truly yeah. do at the core of what I'm doing, you know, believe in what I'm up to. And, you know, now sometimes it's about what your core is like, <laughs> right? You're hoping that people are genuinely interested in your success, if that's what your the room is all about. Um, and sometimes they're not. So, uh, but as long as you're at your core and you're performing, um, polish is not a reflection of whether you're, you know, a, a sh- no, snake oil no, salesman or, or an authentic yeah. person, you know? I don't think authenticity means shoddiness or well, lack of preparation. Yeah, you know, it, I, I think you're right, Will. If, if you're true to yourself, then the last thing you should want is to put your less than best self forward. Right. And, 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 and I believe that sometimes that means pulling together a structure, uh, memorizing some, uh, but when you are on, you're not reading it. You're on. Totally. It's coming from your core. And, and, and it, it, it seems to me that you use the word convincing and, and I want to challenge that if I can. Sure. I don't think our task, our authentic task is to convince somebody. I think our authentic task is to be a, a beacon to like an airport, airport, what we call it, airport lights. You know, I mean, <laughs> yeah. you're out there and you're sorting with people who wants this. I mean, here's me. Here's my message. Who does this resonate with? I completely agree. So, you know, I, I, I thought, you know, that I guess that would be the, the, how people would perceive the relationship of speaking or persuading. Uh, uh-huh. But I really think that once you're out there, um, you are presenting, you know, who you are. And if, and if you want to talk about being an authentic uh, performance, then you're not right for everyone. Right. And, and that comfort and particularly, it's very difficult in the last couple of years because of the isolation that a lot of people have felt is you're not right for so many more people today than you ever were. <laughs> you know, our, and audience, so evident, our right? audience becomes global. Yeah, and it's <laughs> right? digital, but it's digital. And, it, and there's not the same kind of personal relationship that is immediate when you walk in front of a room. It develops in time. But, um, you know, some of those things that we have to, we don't work at in person, we have to work at in video. I think we're learning. I think I where we you. are right now, I think we're about 20% of where we're going to be in the next three to five years in terms of how to relate yep. on doing what we're doing right now. I mean, look at what we're doing. I mean, we agreed that we would be here together at this time on this place and this planet right here. And, know, and, and I mean, and we got the technology. It, it, you know, I can't reach out and touch you physically, but we're having a great conversation here. I, I share that. It, you, you know, also an interesting aspect of that is one of our most innate primal things is to assess risk. And if there were a one benefit of video conferencing is as soon as we get used to the fact that there is almost zero risk threatening mm-hmm. us, once we don't worry about that and we train ourselves not to, I think you're absolutely right that we can get up that curve so much quicker. Um, I spent 22 years before I was in the coaching industry in the financial industry. And most, a lot of that was spent without a lot of technology or at least communication technology. Yeah. And so I lived on the phone. In fact, yeah. in early years, I lived on five phones plus a bat phone, you know, and so they yeah. had all kinds of, and, <laughs> yes. and the lines are always going and you're, you're putting your neck out. But at the same time, I got so good at hearing what people were really saying mm-hmm. through the phone, just the uh-huh. audio message. I knew what they were saying. I knew what they were doing. Like I could create the entire picture and understand if people weren't being truthful with themselves or with me. And that's probably where video will get, we'll get to that um, uh-huh. as soon as we just are continued to be on it. Yeah. I mean, and, and to me, you know, 
I probably have between five and 10 video conversations a day, at least, and maybe one or two on the phone. Yeah. And that's a big difference. Well, it is a big difference. Uh, I do help people in health and wealth, right? And so my wealth people, you won't argue that the last couple of years, if you were in finance, investing and wealth business, you're doing really well. It probably had some of the best, but the aspect of reaching people has changed tremendously. And when you, they were so used to reaching people through the phone, yeah. an interesting dynamic is that people don't answer their phones anymore. No, no. In fact, some people wonder why you don't want a Zoom call or a video call, which is so weird. Um, you know, kids went from texting straight to video. We went from phones to video. And now we don't even want to answer our phones. Um, but that model that worked for the last five decades um, has vanished. And wealth people are having trouble communicating the way they used to. Well, here's what I've learned. This is what I've learned. I finished my first book back in the fall. December comes. I've got it. It's on Amazon. And now I'm sitting around wondering, well, what do I do now? Because of that very reason. I can't walk out and go meet somebody, you know, at a, a networking meeting. Uh, and so I'm writing what we call a clarity break. And I'm writing along. And and I'm saying, well, what do I do? How do I meet new people? How do I have conversations with people? Mm -hmm. and, and then what I heard back, what bubbled up inside me was, well, Will, you only have 12,000 contacts on LinkedIn. Uh, why aren't you talking to them? Oh, well, they just want to sell me something. Right. Oh, well, why aren't they talking to you? Oh, well, they probably think that I just want to sell them something. Well, is that true? Yeah. Well, now, you said you wanted conversations. Now, every one of those people, when they connected with you, said they wanted to have a conversation with you. And the same reason when you connected with them. So why not have a conversation with them? So this is the difference now. What you're talking about is going out and trying to get somebody on the phone, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's the so that's what their I, conundrum. They feel that they uh, need to get somebody. Well, this is the difference. Right. This is the difference between convincing and sorting. Right. What I did was I went back and looked at the last 90 days and said, uh, I got the list of all the people who had connected with me. And then 20 or 30 a day, I would send out this message. Hi, Mike. This is Will. I've been really remiss on following up on LinkedIn. A conversation with you would be awesome. If you want to talk, you can send me some times or you can pick out a time on Calendly. Uh, you can find my calendar on Calendly and pick out one that works with you. I look forward to a great conversation. Yeah. I sent out 20 of those. Two days later, I had five people in my calendar, sitting there, ready to talk. I love that uh, because, you know, I love the, the, the premise and, you know, the preamble on that, which was both sides are just looking for a conversation. Right. You know, and, you know, and out of, out of the, over the, and then, you know, it got up to as many as 10 a day and I had to kind of narrow it down because I was just <laughs> running out of time. But out of all of the conversations I've had since January, I've had not more than two tried to sell me their stuff. The rest of it has been these wonderful conversations, some of them more interesting than others, but sure. great conversations. And so it wasn't trying to use a technique to get somebody to answer the phone. It was really creating an opening for the ones who resonated, wanted to have a great conversation to talk and my goodness, there's plenty of people out there who want to. Well, I think that's the essence of that, the shift, right? And it's the essence of what people really want. And, you know, I, having it thrust upon us, the, the byproduct of that is that we all just want some kind of meaningful conversation, connect a sense of connection and mm -hmm. a community that we can hang with. And that's definitely in, in my business, 
the area that I've found the most comfort and satisfaction as well as success. And that mm-hmm. is um, bringing together smaller communities, uh, a smaller conversation with an important connection. And definitely that thins uh, the options. It definitely sorts because not mm-hmm. everybody's into it. Uh, no. But those who are, I mean, I've held a breakfast weekly, which is just a free drop in breakfast up in intellectual, interesting, fun conversation once a week, every Wednesday, you know, it's sorted itself. And is this it's, online? It's thing, is this yeah. online or face to face? I do a Zoom ah. online and I've been doing it for thir- 14 months now. And it's the one thing that has been, I almost haven't missed other than I took a purposeful hiatus from it for a couple of weeks. But um, yeah, like clockwork I've been on. I've been on with myself <laughs> for breakfast and I because it's just open. Um, and, and no cost. And so I've been on by myself or I've been on with 12 or 13 people, but I've always well, wanted how, how to do keep people, it limited. How do people discover it? On my LinkedIn profile, on my events, I, I always have it. And, and once it's in, once you've come to one, just put it in your calendar. Cause it just is always the exact same time, exact same uh-huh. link, uh, zoom link, uh, link. Yeah. Wow. And, and, nice. and it's just kind of open. I mean, the whole world could show up. I don't know who's going to, you know, sometimes right. I don't know who's going to drop in. And yeah. I think that's kind of the excitement of it. Always there's a core um, that show up and, you know, we've done some amazing things. And, you know, on occasion it gets to that one day someone might have a crisis and we're there. But generally okay. it's, it's more about business topics and ideas and getting through but the week. nobody's going to be there other than the people who want to be there. You're correct. Well, let's see. And I think, I think that that's... I think that that's where we're going in terms of globalization, in terms of communication. I mean, literally, we can talk to anybody in the world right now. Right. It's, uh, you know, three to five years, everybody's going to have a cell phone connected to the Internet. And and if we have their you have access we have access to them and we can invite them. Who's going to show up are the people who want to show up. I don't think there's one person who's done, who's been in rooms, if you will, on Zoom or other, um, that at one point wasn't amazed by how close proximity they were to someone they would maybe think in an, like idolized or someone in a celebrity or someone in, like, I can't believe I was just on a call with that person. And it feels yes. much more in- intimate than sitting in a room with a thousand people listening to them on stage. Oh, you know, Absolutely. because you, 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 you're, you visually are right beside them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But somehow you have an access to them that you never would have gotten in another format. Now I don't like multiple, you know, I always hold my events or anything I do online to, uh, if it takes more than one screen, um, I do another event. I add something because right. I just like one, one yeah. set of panels. And, and if you know, right. it's just my thing. Yeah. That's, 30, right? It's plenty. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good size room. That's Any right. Room. It's all about the edutainment anyways. And well, well and, and I think also that that everybody is the same size. Right? Figuratively and literally. Well, I mean every, yeah, you know we're all in the uh, same box. It, it, we're all in the same size box. It's not like, oh, here's the top one, here's the big one, and we're all down here. It's we're all in the same box. And I think that 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 allows us to mentally see ourselves as capable of having a conversation with anybody on that screen. Oh, yeah. You know, I have been on some been fortunate to be on some calls with some what people might say powerful or ultra uber celebrity type people. And it feels there is you do not feel that difference that you would normally feel there's no yeah. entourage there's no and the in charisma is kind of a, more available on video but it's it's not the same right you know that yeah. magnetic personality it's not so magnetic always through the video and so there's a sometimes intimidation or overwhelm with that it drops away and so it's kind of an interesting 
uh, you know, one of those good bonuses that I think everybody, but then a lot of them are getting shrewd and they're just like, I can't show up at all these, you know, rooms and just be the guy who is, Hey, I'm just showing my face. <laughs> I have yet, to, I have yet to have somebody come on with some big music going on behind them uh, and, and, and a big applause and everybody let's yeah. stand up and shout and scream. I've not yet seen that happen in a zoom meeting. <laughs> no. And, and you're absolutely right. And so some of it is challenging and on the, on the challenging side, uh, getting a room to feedback with in a way that um, is sometimes needed um, can be very challenging uh, yeah. in a room where people, I don't know, they choose to throw off their video all of a sudden, you know, they're not in, they're not engaged. And so there's lots of that, that we work through. Um, but we're without, learning you know, how to do, we're, we're learning. learning how. To do it. Yeah. 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 Yes. And so it, it's, it's, it's great in, in innovation really. Yeah. Uh, Mike, this is great. I'm, I'm looking forward to what we're going to do. We'll take a little break here. And uh, uh, here's some of our sponsors, but then we come back and I want to hear much more about what uh, Grow, Get, Give is about from your perspective. Great. Looking forward. There are two kinds of entrepreneurs, those who run their business and those whose business runs them. If your business runs you, you're probably frustrated, worn out, and wondering what it's going to take to break the cycle and start enjoying life again. For thousands of entrepreneurs around the world, business and life got better when they began implementing EOS, the Entrepreneurial Operating System. EOS is a set of simple concepts and practical tools used by more than 100,000 companies to clarify, simplify, and achieve their vision. Businesses running on EOS have grown faster, increased profits, and attracted and retained better people. Stop letting your business run you and start running your business. Schedule a free 90-minute meeting with an EOS implementer. These teachers, coaches, and facilitators are passionate about helping leaders like you get better results and live better lives. Visit EOSWorldwide.com today. That's EOSWorldwide.com. All right. So, so Mike... Talk about what you do with your clients. What I do is walk them through this grow, get, give thing. Uh, <clears throat> we start though, and you alluded to it earlier when we were chatting, is uh, with something I just published an ebook on Amazon, and the concept it's it's something I call total quantum impact, and really it's the dream, a process of dreaming, uh -huh. and you can't. I found that in the last couple of years, people in the pandemic and COVID were in a fog. Um, and I liken it a little bit to if you're a golfer and you're about to tee off, but it's, it's a dreary, foggy day. There's a little wind, a little bit of rain. There's no way you can see, you know, the green from there. You can't see the flag. Um, you can barely see a hundred yards in front of you. Um, you played the course, but suddenly you feel very unfamiliar. And you're just about to swing and you step back because you just don't understand the path to get to where you want to be. And you used to be able to see it extraordinarily clearly. And today, because of all the elements of uncertainty, you're just not able to. And what I developed was this idea behind taking that dream and seeing it with clarity, understanding you can see the green, you can see the hole, you can see the flag with perfect clarity, which allows you to have focus on moving forward and building a plan. Because as we know, once we get the biggest dreams out of our heads and we go, well, how are we going to do that? How are we going to get a, you know, humans to live on Mars? Well, you got to build this and that, and then you got to do all this, build a rocket. And all of the things needed suddenly fall into place. And then each one becomes a goal of its own. And then suddenly you've got this roadmap right? With clarity. So you can easily get to the next marker and the next marker and the next marker. So what I do is bring people through a process that I call total quantum impact, which is about getting those dreams and then measuring them, quantifying what it's going to take to get you there. I, you know, maybe we never reach the biggest part of the dream, but along the way, we're going to achieve some major stuff. So that lays the groundwork for where we want to go both personally and professionally. 
And I always add philanthropically. It kind of comes out in the wash. And so people, because people ultimately who think bigger, think bigger than themselves, right? And then grow, get, give is just a simple process. And we apply it like a three-legged stool. It's about stability, not so much about balance, but about stability. Where do you need the most stability or most leveling in your business or biggest lift in your business? So maybe it's grow. Maybe you need to figure out how do I position my why with my message in a way that packages, positions it and promotes it in the right way. Or maybe it's get, maybe my messaging is great but I'm working so much. I don't see my family. I don't have a life. So it's get, how do I captivate people? Like how do I work with people processes and systems to set me free? And I always say people give you, uh, you know, set you, give you freedom processes, give you leverage and systems give you scale. Right. And so we work through things to help maybe on what we you might call practice management or business management skills. And then lastly, it's the give things really well, but we just haven't connected with why we're here on this planet or why we think we're here and giving back to oneself through personal development and their family, as well as giving to your community through professional development and ultimately giving to the universe through philanthropic development. So it may be one of three, some you might need to push, some you might need to pull, but it's all three matter. And we work on all three and we do one of each at a time. And I try, you know, one of the questions you ask in your little preamble before we get on the call is what are your strategies to get through, you know, sometimes. And I try to give people a very simple approach if they're really trying to figure out how to feel good about their day. And that is do one of a grow activity, one of a get activity and one of a give activity. And if you are capable of achieving that every single day of the year, your life would be so much richer and the place you are after a year relative to where you are today will be so much further ahead. And so just one thing, you know, how do you position yourself one time better? Or, you know, what is that? You know, how do you get more freedom in one little way today better than you were yesterday? And, you know, how do you give to yourself, to your family, your community, or the world at large in one way? And what did you do today to do that? And if you just do those, check that list every day, you can go to bed content that you did something good. All right. So here's a question for you. When we think of somebody who is on the way to being a successful business person, entrepreneur, they they get a clear picture of, this is a, a typical EOS uh, successful EOS implementation to a company. You know, here's a guy who or a woman who's been working way too much, 60, 70, 80 hours a week. When they begin to delegate and elevate, they begin to put together an accountability chart. They've got a vision traction organizer. They have the tools. Yeah. Then they begin to see how this business is going to work. And very often, they're not working 60, 70 hours. They're working... 20, 30, maybe 40 if they really want to, but they're only doing the things that they love doing, and they have people around them who love doing the things that they got delegated to. Then, Now, what I'm looking for is how do you, how can we help those people who have been so focused on making this business work now that it's working how do we get them in touch with that deeper dream that they had as a child, that kind of experience they had as a child? What do we do with that? How do we help them? It's not just going on another golf date, even if it's a golf date in Scotland. There's something there that's that's going to carry them for the rest of their lives, which may be 25, 30, 40 years. The, or the first part of that, that overworking and then finding that, nice space. Um, Uh You know, I love that because that's the transition from what you give up to get versus Mm -hmm. how you understand that you, you give to get right. Like once you understand that you give to yourself, to everybody else around you and to your customers and stakeholders, you get much more. And and part of that is you get freedom. Mm -hmm. The next step is giving permission. 
And one of the roles I play in a lot of my clients' life lives <laughs> is, is that I help give them permission to dream, to help give them permission to expand their minds to a point that uh, you might think this is crazy or, oh boy, I was telling my friends and they think I'm nuts for saying this. You know, I say, tell me more. Yeah. And so, and why would you think this might be good? And what is, what's in it for you in that way? And allow them that freedom. In, in other words, expand the sandbox, you know, and pour yeah. a little more sand in and throw in a couple of toys, right? You know, and see what happens. That's, I, that's the essence of, uh, you know, part of the coaching experience is that you're not there just to put guardrails in and guidelines and tactics. You're also there to be part of the uplifting. You know, athletic coaches don't spend the whole time in rigid corners and contexts. They open up possibilities and they take the best of you, just like EOS does, and upswings it, upscales it. And so you're here to put, that's where you pump a little air into the sails. It's not uh, disingenuous. It's all about what could you be if you really wanted to be? So it's about is, giving permission. Is that the role of a, a manager in today's uh, either totally remote or hybrid environment to be that kind of uplifter for people in business? Well, good. I think we'll agree. Good leaders serve. Right. And so if that's what your peers, stakeholders, or whoever is under your purvey at the time or within your purvey, um, if that's what they need, then that's how you should serve. So it's more on a leader to investigate what is required. Uh, I, th I think there's always a place for those who choose to uplift, but it's not always the circumstance and the opportunity that you need to address first and foremost. However, a great leader will inspire through their actions as a role model as much as they are through someone who lifts others. And finding that balance and finding when it's appropriate, absolutely. But a good leader serve, and if you've done your work, your homework of discovery to understand how serving will be best in place for those people, then, you know, then that's your guide. Chances are you will find that um, getting people inspired through what is important to them um, will certainly help. And sometimes just, you know, like using good time management and process management skills, sometimes you're going to find that those people very well aren't motivated to show up every day because their job is as fulfilling as the fact that they're there committed to do the best that they can at their job so that their lives have meaning in a different way. And so they're not mm -hmm. always there because you want them to be there and they're as motivated as you are. I mean, entrepreneurs and owners and execs, we have visions of how we want, but not everybody have to buy in. Um, uh, we just have to find how they buy into their best performance for us. Tell me about when we think about uh, uh, work from home or some combination of that, how, how has that affected your coaching practice? <laughs> Well, the effects on coaching um, were profound. And I'm uh, more of a exclude, like a, a closer, I don't have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people in a list. My, my business has always been um, a closer knit group, closer knit groups, a little bit of a premium uh, on how I get compensated and a very specific type of person. So I entered a, a pandemic without 200,000 people in a list. Uh, there are coaches who do fine work um, out there who um, have hundreds of thousands or millions of people. And they flooded the market with free product and they flooded it with low cost product and, and they're still doing it. And I commend them, you know, that's their business model. Uh, and the quality now though is way better for 99 bucks <laughs> or whatever yeah. uh, than it was at the beginning of this. They were throwing stuff at the wall and, I think there was some, you know, mess noise, but now it's sorting. It's the challenge that's evolving now is if you're not building, uh, if that's not your model and you're not building a community, you're going to be left out because there's no middle ground. You're either a high quality, high produced. I can sell 
a thousand memberships at a 99 bucks in an hour, or you're the uh, relationship builder who is just working one at a, or small groups at a time, one at a time. So the middle ground is dead. Uh-huh. And that extreme has definitely affected the coaching industry. The delivery of coaching, um, I miss greatly miss the personal aspect of being in a room with people and seeing the marvels of how a, a mastery, a mastermind session will go or how a good workshop goes, you know, physically, mm-hmm. because you just, the energy is just unstoppable. Uh, however, that's an opportunity in the marketplace now with people from all over. Um, and then the ideas that come into the room when you have people from the UK and, you know, Texas and Ch- California and, you know, Squamish, BC, um, it's amazing what can happen because the ideas just flow freely. And there's a lot of, I never thought of that that way, you know, that happens right. so much. So which, which sometimes is it sometimes it's just their context that they're bringing, right? They're saying, this is the way we think about it here. Their context. And, and, and it's so different, which sounds like a never a whole new idea, which I just think is amazing what we're doing in the world today is we are actually talking to people who are in different cultural and mental and emotional contexts. You're, you're absolutely right. And, and geographically, a lot of people that I'm now engaging with in small groups um, wouldn't be in my, in my room because they wouldn't have right. traveled there. They, you know, the logistics just wouldn't have worked out to make sense for a day or two with me. And now they're in the room. And so it's interesting when you've got, um, you know, a touring rock star and, uh, and a person who owns and runs a private jet completion company and a fitness professional, you know, and you have another coach or two, like when you have those people in the room and you go, what did you learn? It's like me in my business in the finance world. What did I learn from my dentist? I learned a lot on how to run my business from my dentist about time management and controlling my hours, right. And controlling access. Mm -hmm. Um, I learned a lot from a person who ran a big, gigantic leasing company, you know, how to deal with HR um, in my financial service business. So what I can learn from all those different things is you constantly get that barrage of, wow, um, I'm really learning. And and it's not polar. Like the people on the, you know, the private jet side are learning just as much from the person in the wellness concierge as the drummer is learning from, you know, it's just amazing. Yeah, that well, that's what I I just find that just astounding what we're doing. I mean, we're yes, we are recovering from Zoom fatigue. Yes, we have learned all of those things. At the same time, we are going to get we're going to find so much value in this new world that uh, you know apparently was coming along under the radar, and and the pandemic just accelerated it. Uh, uh, but I think we're just going to have. And I think it's going to be a so exciting the next three to five years. It's going to be so exciting. Just got through talking to uh, part of the new industrial class in America. And, and he's talking about hundreds of thousands of jobs that he is actually creating. And it's going to put people to work in ways that they're going to be very fulfilled from it. And that's going to happen. Yeah, I, I, you know, what I fashion it to is this, there's a democratization of information and mentorship that used to be only available to the few. Yes. And the, the key is we're still in this transition um, from the commoditization of it. So we're, you know, it became a commodity real fast in the pandemic. Uh, that's getting weeded out so that we have the positive, which is the democratization, the access. Um, yeah. Commoditization just brings it to a lower common denominator, but you're, you can access high quality relationships um, that, are, that will work for you now uh, in a vast medium. And, and that's, that's an excellent thing. Think of commodification. I think of what happened to the Native Americans uh, uh, my wife introduced that to me because she's a Native American. And, and there was a time in the 1880s, 90s, and it's still going on today when the excess uh, food was called commodities that were given to the Native Americans. And they call them commods. Mm. But it was always low quality stuff. Right. Right. 
here's the commods, but it, it had an impact on their health. But the same thing is true for us, too. When it's just a commodity, it has an effect on our mental, emotional and physical uh, state of being. There's a big difference between the real thing and a low cost commodity. And full disclosure, I've dealt with living in a world of commoditization around me, feeling occasionally throughout the last couple of years. Um, how do I connect the dem democratization of it, the access, um, without falling into the commodity realm? And being the individual creating that niche is difficult occasionally, probably more so mentally than it is really in, in, in actuality. Um, uh -huh. But to stand out, differentiate as a unique offering that is helpful um, uh -huh. and premium, still a lot of noise. And occasionally from time to time that sometimes you don't feel like you can elevate the same way as being put on a stage or, you know, being putting on the front of the workshop to run it all. You know, that physical positioning leads to that authority positioning. And <laughs> finding that magic online to the digital masses continues to be a conundrum. And I don't think anyone can say they've perfected it yet. No, no, I don't think we've perfected it. What I'm discovering, what I'm discovering is that when I make contributions, there are times when people come back and say, that was golden. That was a nugget. That is part, of, for me, that's part of positioning. Not because I chose to position, but because I chose to be authentic and to contribute the best that I have. Right. Then that has an effect on what we used to call positioning. And it has something to do with presence. There's something there that... I'm just learning about now. <laughs> well, you, you, you know, you have a calm demeanor. Um, you, you have your thing. You have this thoughtful, um, likable uh, approach to things. Uh, and, you know, I know I, I'm a little more energetic. I come across a little bit more enthusiastic. I still feel 20 years old, you know. Uh, and, <laughs> and yet, uh, you know, there are ways that people gravitate. And one thing is I'm an extraordinarily aggressive hand talker and the good thing about video is most times people don't know <laughs> notice how it's like a duck you know my, my feet are going a mile a minute <laughs> well mike this has just been wonderful this has just been absolutely wonderful i've got your total quantum uh book downloaded i'm gonna read it and awesome. uh, i'm gonna enjoy it and i commend it to everyone else it, it's the the price is right right yeah, it's not, you know, it was an ebook. So this was part of it. How do you build a, a, a mechanism by which to introduce people to something I think is extremely valuable? And yeah. that is dreaming and quantifying that dream. And so I built this book, created video series. It's just the, the videos are just the book. It's just the script. And then packaged up all the different bits and pieces. And that's the marketing. So it was the entire package. And, you know, this one is quite important to me because I do think that we're just too far away from dreaming about big things. And yeah. yet look at the most inspiring things that are happening, you know, with the biggest dreamers, uh, you know, and yeah. we're alive and well in our presence and we should be listening. Absolutely. To that, you know, absolutely. We're going to have a, a tremendously exciting next uh, uh, three to five years. I am so excited about it. And so glad that, that we could spend this time together. And I look forward to the next conversation that we have. Well, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. I certainly enjoy the time I spend with you. So uh, tell people how they can get uh, get in touch with you or where they should go. I suggest the two best places are simply my growgetgive.com website. Um, you can just Google me, my name, if you can figure out how to spell it. And LinkedIn. Those two spots are where you're going to connect with me the best, learn a little bit more, and find out what I'm up to. Excellent. Well, thanks, Mike. This is just another example of how businesses and people in business thrive, even in California. <laughs> You've been listening to The Pilgrim on the 405 with Will Christ. To hear more of the programs in this podcast, go to www.willchrist.com.